<laughs> Knock it off, guys. Sorry. What is yes, this? no, no. Right. Oh, going on? So, uh, um, all right, well, thank you everyone for coming uh, to our second event in two weeks. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, yes. Alice and I. Yes, you're following closely other. on her heels. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> uh, I'm obviously Dustin Siebel, uh, and uh, this is Linda Rabia, who comes to us from MIT, um, where she teaches political philosophy, uh, and uh, her bio also includes uh, that she came here to speak at MSU. That's the yes, most recent item on exciting. her biography. Right. And um, Ariel Helfer, uh, who is assistant professor at Wayne State, will be uh, responding to her paper on Plato's Statesman. So please join me in welcoming Linda Rubia to MSU. Um, so it's, it's very nice uh, to be, very, very nice, a real honor to be here at MSU um, because uh, back in the 90s, I uh, spent a year here. My husband is a postdoc at MSU. And uh, I've heard that people say that I think MSU is famous for like Sports, maybe basketball or something like that. I, that's what I heard. But for me, MSU is famous because it was just the most extraordinarily intellectually invigorating year. We had such a great time. Uh, I think Dick, you're the only person here from that time. I think Tobin wasn't. Tobin wasn't here no, then either. I'm, I was fossilized. But it was. A, well, I'm glad. I'm glad uh, because. Uh, it, Wonderful. It's wonderful to be back, and it brings back a lot of memories. Um, the other thing I just want to say uh, about the statesman is a little bit of an apology about the statesman, because as I mentioned a minute ago, it's a, it's a very uh, uninviting dialogue. I often think of my uh, education had begun with um, <laughs> flying a statesman. There is almost no way I would have continued <laughs> um, studying uh, political theory. Um, and I, I had first made some, I had first taken a look at the statesman when I was working on courage, um, uh, Plato's treatment of courage, uh, and uh, I, you know, I had read, I knew that there was some discussion of courage and manliness in it, and I just thought, yeah, there's no way I can deal with this <laughs> dialogue as part of, of my dissertation. And then um, a number of years later, when I was in Boston, I, um, I sat in on a, a class of uh, Chris Brule's um, on the Statesman, and that was sort of the first time I kind of, uh, that, that helped sort of resurrect my interest in the Statesman and a determination to get back to it at some point. But I had two small children <laughs> at the time, and uh, so that didn't happen then. Um, but uh, anyway, finally, I'm, uh, I'm turning now again uh, to try to work on it. So with that as a thrilling prelude, <laughs> now I'm sure you're all so excited for, for what follows, um, uh, I'll turn to my prepared remarks. Um, and I actually don't think I'm going away, but there's no actual time limit. But I have a sense of how long this, this should take. So buckle in. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this talk is an attempt to begin to understand Plato's depiction of the Eleatic stranger and its connection to his portrait of Socrates. It takes an unusual route, though, beginning at the end of the encounter between the two men that's recorded in the sophist and the statesman, where the stranger cryptically concludes the statesman and that whole, his whole uh, presence in the Platonic dialogues, um, that the task of the true statesman is to weave together the moderate and manly human beings and thereby create a smooth web of harmony and friendship that holds the city together. Now, the stranger's claim, I think at first seems eminently sensible and even appealing, the art of politics, consists in addressing the problem of partisanship by reconciling opposing elements in the city. But there are, to say the least, a number of puzzling features. Who are the manly and the moderate, and why is their enmity the key political problem? The task of the true statesman. What does it mean to weave 
them together? And finally, does the stranger's account of this task differ from Socrates' understanding of the task that he attributes to himself when he says, for example, in the Gorgias, that he alone practices the true political art? So let me begin by making a few brief statements about the substance of this dialogue, uh, whose surface, as I indicated, is both difficult and decidedly charmless, as well as about its context, to give you a better sense of the important and interesting question at stake. Now, both the statesman and the sophist are conducted by an Eleatic stranger, a Parmenidean philosopher from Elea, who's asked by Socrates to distinguish the sophist, the statesman, and the philosopher. Socrates himself participates in the conversation only briefly at the beginning of each dialogue, quickly assuming the position of a silent onlooker as the stranger converses first with the Atidas and then at the beginning of the statesman and at the stranger's request with Theotetus's companion, someone very oddly named, young Socrates. How about that? Unfortunately, rather than the exciting drama of dialectics that we often get in Plato's dialogues, the stranger's process of identifying the statesman involves a dry and often baffling division of all the kinds of commanding knowledge. Which, by which he means a theoretical knowledge that issues in commands. The upshot of this division, this long dividing process, is the statesman is one who possesses this science, the science of the nurture of landed, hornless, non-species mixing, two-footed animals, and whose closest cousin is the swineherd, okay? So if that isn't peculiar enough, a little later on, in order to distinguish the true statesman's activity from his rivals, the stranger embarks on a comparable division of the art of weaving, arriving at the particular art of cloak making that involves braiding together the warp and the woof as the paradigm of the true statesman's, statesman's distinctive task. So it's perfectly clear now, right, what one who has a science of politics knows. Now the second thing to mention, this is the interesting timing and context of this dialogue. The statesman occurs at a very interesting moment in Socrates' life, sometime around the last six weeks. Socrates picks up the conversation with the stranger only, uh, sorry, after having just returned from hearing his indictment. Socrates' famous penchant for refuting and the terrible consequences of it are well known, and the stranger indicates in a few places, in both the sophist and the statesman, that he is aware of Socrates' predicament. The stranger's own account of the statesman may thus be an expression of some perplexity, perhaps to be developed later, in a private conversation about Socrates' peculiar refutations by way of showing Socrates how a philosopher correctly engages in political activity so as to avoid precisely the predicament in which Socrates currently finds himself. So what I hope to do today is to show that by unpacking the conclusion to the stranger's long and puzzling account of political science, what is it that the statesman knows, we can begin to understand something of the conversation between the two, between Socrates and the stranger, that's occurring, this is a tip of the hat to our friend Arthur Melzer, uh, occurring between the lines. Uh, the argument that follows that I'm gonna give is divided into three sections. First, the stranger's view of the political problem created by these two groups, the manly and the moderate. Second, what the stranger has in mind by leaving them together and what he understands to be the goal of this process. And finally, some observations about the Socratic reform that we find in the Republic and what the stranger's account suggests about the grounds of the difference between the account that we find of the education of the guardians and Socrates in the Republic and the account of, uh, that I'm going to discuss in the States. 
and just briefly to anticipate the conclusion, uh, the stranger's understanding of the statesman's task is rooted in the view that the knowers, philosophers, but he doesn't use that word, the knowers concern with non-knowers is limited to educating non-knowers with a view to protecting the pursuit of science. Thus, whatever the agreements between the stranger and Socrates might be on other matters, the stranger's account in the statesman distills something distinctive about Socratic politics and thus helps to shed light on the meaning of Socratic political philosophy. Okay, so first section on the manly and the moderate. The stranger's account of the statesman's task begins with a very strange prelude. He does not at first describe the problem confronting the statesman as a battle between the manly and the moderate. He first explains the problem rather mysteriously um, as a tension between a part and a species of virtue. When, understandably, young Socrates doesn't understand what he's talking about, he seems to change his approach, describing the problem instead as a tension between two parts of virtue. And this change is somewhat relevant, and I am going to come back to it later. But in the meantime, we're talking about the tension between now two parts of virtue. And the problem is, is that there are two opposing parts of virtue, manliness on, or courage on the one hand and moderation on the other. They are fundamentally at odds with each other. Okay, so to explain how they can both be parts of virtue, but still opposites, opposite from each other, the stranger notes that quickness and slowness can both be described as beautiful or noble. We praise something either for its quickness or its slowness, depending on the circumstances. So in other words, neither quickness nor, or, nor slowness is beautiful in itself but only insofar as it is, as the stranger says, opportune or fitting in the moment. Thus, a runner winning a race is praised for his swift stride, while an adagio movement is praised for its leisurely and gentle tempo. But each is blamed when it's inappropriate or ill-timed or not fitting. So the very leisurely pace of snail mail is annoying, not beautiful. But we don't yet have an account of manliness and moderation that explains their enmity. That comes only when the stranger describes those with manly and moderate natures. In this case, neither manliness nor moderation is praised or blamed because it's fitting or opportune. Rather, each nature praises or blames actions, he says, on account of kinship. One praises or blames what accords with one's natural inclination. And, on account, and on, it's on account of this uh, that the two natures develop an extensive and mutual enmity about many things. Now, the manly and the moderate are distinguished by the fact that they don't take their bearings right by what's fitting or appropriate, but rather simply by what's either manly or moderate, which, when the particular tendency is not fitting, yields a bad result, right? So the manly man wants to compete, whether it's with an equal or with a child. I think there's some famous movie scenes like this. And the moderate moves slowly, even when you know the fire alarm is blaring or the car horn is honking. I'm not talking about anybody in particular, but <laughs> uh, they always move slowly. OK. Now, it's to underscore, I think, the effect of this tendency that the stranger suddenly stops speaking about manliness and moderation as two parts of virtue and begins referring to them as two species of virtue. Those who are manly on the one hand and moderate on the other consider themselves to be a, or the equivalent of a distinct species and not a subset of virtue where certain dispositions are sometimes fitting and sometimes not. Each thinks of itself as a separate and independent class taking its natural disposition to be the proper standard or guiding principle according to which everything else uh, should be assessed. And so we now can, I think, see better the difficulty, right? These two natures are always going to be straining in opposing directions. Manly types will always be disposed to quick and vigorous actions and see all um, cautious and slow actions as 
cowardly, and moderate types will always be disposed to act slowly and cautiously, and they'll treat all quick and vigorous actions, as he says, hubristic and mad. So to put the matter politically in a way that we, you know, we would recognize, if you're manly, it's always reasonable to strike first, and if you're moderate, it's always reasonable to negotiate. But the stranger then explains in more detail the specific harm that results from this enmity. Now, as I've indicated, their distinctive natures seek different ways of life for the city. The exceptionally orderly, as he calls them, wish to live a quiet life, minding their own business. And in their associations with everyone at home and outside the city, they seek peace, he says, on every issue. By itself, the inclination to peace and stability is not a problem. But the stranger adds that their ill-timed or inappropriate love of peace causes them to approach every action in an unwarlike state and to condition their young in this way such that they are always the prey of aggressors. Ultimately, this causes them, their children, and the entire city to become slaves without, this is a quote, without their being aware of it. Uh, the manly, so that's the extreme to which the moderate are prone. The manly, by contrast, are aggressive and confrontational. They are always, he says, rousing their cities for war, and on account of this desire, which the stranger calls more intense or violent than necessary, they establish a hatred, he says, with the powerful, or the powerful ones, and either destroy their fatherlands or risk becoming slaves and subjects to their enemies. The upshot is that as long as the manly and the moderate remain as two species of virtue, each thinking that its natural inclination is the standard for the city's action, both lead the city to harmful extremes. Okay, but whether they put these two extremes, whether they put the city at risk in the same way is actually unclear from the stranger's language. Both the manly and moderate put the city at risk of becoming, he said, slaves. But only in the case of the manly does the stranger specify that this means the city is defeated or enslaved by its enemies. The risk from the moderate extreme is different. They are charged with influencing their young such that all become slaves to some unspecified aggressors Without, he then strangely adds, they're becoming aware of it. So how can someone be unaware of becoming a slave? And I think the stranger must mean that they become slaves, not in the conventional sense, but in some unusual way. And we get a clue as to his meaning from an earlier part of the argument. Now, recall that I had said the stranger had engaged in a division of the art of leaving to help identify the true statesman's task, the upshot of which was that it is the true task of the weaver to braid together the warp and the woof, the warp being the man, the woof being the warp, if you know weaving, <laughs> lining up with the, the moderate. Um, now, just as there are others, as he tells us, who claim to be as necessary as the weaver, in bringing about the final woven article, which they determined was a protective cloak, there are others who claim in the political analog to be what he calls co-causes with the statesmen of the care of the human herd. So to, then to distinguish the particular function of the statesmen, the stranger goes on to identify and distinguish all those in the city who seem to care for the human herd. And the class in which he finds the pretenders to statesmanship turn out to be the broad class of slaves and servants. So the class in which he finds those who claim to care for the herd, but in fact aren't quite the statesmen, that is this broad class of slaves and servants. This class includes not only conventional Greek slaves, 
but also priests, diviners, and then most significantly, the ordinary political men who vie for rule in the city. So they're in this class of, of servants and slaves who claim to care for the herd of the city, but are somehow not quite the true statesmen. Now, the stranger doesn't explain why he locates the political men in this class. We might expect him to say it's because they serve the city, right? You would imagine the political men in the city serve the city, and that's why they're in the class of servants and slaves. But he doesn't say that. And further on, he actually offers a different reason. He refers to the political types as front men. Apologies if you're watching the school games. Um, they're front men of the greatest images and as imitations of them, of those greatest images. Here the stranger seems to suggest that those of the political class don't serve the city, but rather are themselves servants or even slaves of the teachings or images they represent. The slavery to which the stranger then seems to refer when he speaks of the moderate becoming slaves without their being aware of it, remember that important um, corollary, may thus also be an enslavement to the teachings and images of which the political class is a purveyor. The stranger underscores the power of such teachings, and thus how they could be enslaving, by speaking of, quote, the chorus of those who establishment, uh, the chorus, just being quotes, of those who establish them, i.e. the political men, uh, as, who established those teachings, as the greatest enchanter and sophist. And this would also explain the stranger's claim that when the moderate become enslaved, they also condition their young in the same way. So the idea is once the moderate are enthralled into this political class and the teachings they represent, their young will be mold molded according um, and equally enslaved to these teachings. Okay, so second section. We're gonna talk about the weaving now, now that we've identified commonly moderate and what the problematic tendencies are. By describing the political problem as an opposition between the manly and the moderate, it might have seen that the stranger's account of the political problem would be a pretty familiar account of political partisanship between aggressive hawks itching to go to war and peaceful doves preferring the quiet of private life. But having indicated the extreme to which the moderate are prone as an enslavement to a fraudulent political class um, that operates as the face of a particular teaching, the stranger seems to have something else in mind than that more familiar political problem. What, he, what I think he does have in mind becomes evident when he states almost at the very, very end of the dialogue, and this, I'll quote the whole, uh, line, that the single and whole work of the royal weaving is never to allow the moderate ca characters to stand apart or revolt from the manly, but by bringing together out of them a smooth web, always to entrust to these in common the offices of cities. Now, the antagonism, and there is an antagonism here that the stranger highlights, it's at once concrete and obscure. He specifies the problem, the moderate stand apart or revolt from the manly, but he doesn't explain the cause of their revolt or why they refuse to stand with the manly. To understand this, we have to return to what the stranger says about the extremes to which both groups are prone. So first, the manly types. In their tendency to aggression and confrontation, the manly types come into conflict not with the moderate, but with powerful, the powerful or powerful ones. Moreover, 
the stranger knows that those whose manliness is not tempered by moderation are led to godlessness, insolence, and injustice. And I think if we put these statements together, the stranger's point seems to be something like this, that in their desire to express sort of strength, perhaps dignity, um, uneducated manly types sort of blatantly challenge or flaunt their disregard for powerful beings, which would include gods, rulers, and laws. And this would then explain, or help to explain, why uneducated moderate types, so corresponding moderate types, become slavish. When the manly types sort of go on the attack against um, uh, perhaps especially the gods, but also rulers and laws, the moderates stand apart or revolt from them by throwing themselves into the arms of the reassuring and protective teachings of that greatest enchanter. Teachings that can counter manly uh, transgression and impiety and give the moderate the protection they desire. So the more precise political problem then, according to the stranger, is that manly provocation drives the moderate to put themselves into the hands of those who are pretenders to statesmanship, those the stranger refers to as the statesman's rivals. So the true statesman's task would be to counter this scenario and establish what the stranger calls a smooth web by binding and braiding the two natures together through what he calls a divine bond that consists in a shared opinion about the noble, just, and good things. Now, big surprise, but the stranger doesn't provide any examples of the appropriate noble, just, and good opinions. But their divine character, right, he calls it a divine bond, suggests at the very least that they involve a, some sort of shared opinion, you could say, about the character of gods. The stranger had earlier noted that qualities praised as beautiful or noble not only describe actions or souls, but also images or forms that are depicted in writings and music. And these would seem to include images of gods. So the statesman's task then, according to the stranger, seems to be some kind of teaching or establishment through laws or writings, he uses both those terms, specific opinions about what is noble, just, and good, which, as I already said, would seem to include a different teaching about the gods, likely something which the manly could accept. If this were possible, right, then the moderate could be woven into that outlook, an outlook superior to that of the statesman's rivals. The true statesman's task seems to be to educate the manly, um, ultimately so as to prevent the moderate from putting the city in the hands of the true statesman's rivals. But I think we then have to ask, Wait, what exactly is the problem with when the moderate become enslaved to the greatest enchanters and sophists, the false pretenders to statesmanship? After all, the stranger doesn't give what might be an obvious answer to that question, uh, right? Well, it's bad for the city. <laughs> it harms the city. The problem, according to the argument that I've laid out, is that through this series of events, this, the city is put in the hands of the statesmen's, of, of the, yeah, sorry, I wrote it wrong here, of the statesmen's rivals. That by itself seems to be the problem, that it's in the hands of the statesmen's rivals, not simply that it's bad for the city. So why emphasize this rivalry to the true statesmen? And in fact, the stranger identifies this as the problem from practically the outset of the dialogue. He conveys the seriousness of the problem of the rivals most directly when he explains, when he first explains the importance of identifying them. It's because he says they, quote, dispute with him, the true statesman, about the web itself. 
if I understand the stranger's reference here to the disputed web correctly, he's indicating, I think, the problem with the rivals is that they don't understand the true purpose or po of politics or of the city. Okay, so as we've seen, the stranger identifies those who most need to be distinguished from the statesmen as the front men for the various incorrect regimes, front men, representatives, the faces of the various incorrect regimes. Um, and uh, to clarify why they're not true statesmen, the stranger launches into a discussion of regimes in the course of which he discloses the correct regime and thus, implicitly, the fundamental defect of these rivals. Now, this discussion of regime and uh, law is very famous, and uh, it's a, in itself difficult and very interesting discussion. It certainly deserves its own extended analysis and can't be adequately examined here. But <laughs> nevertheless, here is a very simplified summary. The problem is as follows. The only correct regime is a regime ruled by science or by one who knows, he's an expert in the sense, he knows what is advantageous for the ruled. That is to say, the correct regime is not a regime of laws, but one where an expert can adjust what is required, can always be adjusting what's required according to the circumstances. But such a regime is impossible, both because it's impossible to prescribe what's best for each individual, but also because human beings don't trust experts. They always fear being exploited. And for an expert to rule would require ruling forcibly and unjustly. So all actual regimes will be inferior and should operate as much as possible in imitation of the one correct regime. But then, it's kind of like, you know, head-turning moment, the best of the inferior regimes turns out to be the polar opposite of the rule of the expert, not just the rule of law, but the rule of extreme law-abidingness. Yet, as the stranger points out, there is a very troubling implication to this development for the arts and sciences. In a regime of laws, when one inquires into the arts on one's own authority against either the writings or laws, um, and here, uh, when talking about the arts, he first specifies the art of piloting and medicine, but then he, does, he goes on to refer to many others, including what he refers to as sciences. Um, but in any case, when one inquires into the arts on one's own authority against the laws and the writings, then the stranger says, Anyone who wants can and is permitted to draw up an indictment and haul that one before a court of justice to punish him with extreme penalties, right? It sounds familiar, hopefully. Put simply, strict rule of law is the best practicable regime, but this regime is in tension with art and science, such that all those who pursue science risk running afoul of the law. In so far then as the rivals represent a teaching that is not concerned or doesn't understand science, there will be less security and protection for those who pursue it. Thus, if rule of law is the best possible regime, then for the protection of art and science, without which young Socrates and the stranger agree life is unlivable, the nature of the political class who defend the laws and writings is the crucial consideration. If they are less extreme, perhaps especially less pious or with a less uh, extreme piety, the laws can be less hostile to science and to knowers more generally. Okay, so now we see that the deepest problem is actually not between the manly and the moderate, but rather between the knowers and the non-knowers. And it's actually that problem to which, uh, to which the stranger first referred when, if you remember I said that very abstract thing, when you first referred um, 
uh, to um, a part of virtue being at odds with a species of virtue. If virtue is knowledge, then knowers are that species of virtue, and they would be at odds with what is in fact, although it doesn't consider itself to be a defective version of virtue. And it is specifically a part, according to the stranger, because ultimately it's the moderate who in their greater openness to the rivals are a bigger obstacle to the best practical regime, which would also be the one hospitable to science. Okay, third section. Now the two come together, Socrates versus Eliade. So to recap my suggestion thus far, political knowledge, according to the stranger, is the knowledge that the statesman's task is to protect the practice of science in the city, which means molding a political class that's moderate in its concern for or pursuit of spirited dignity and tougher with respect to its piety. This kind of education may sound familiar, right? A little bit like that which Socrates provides for the guardians in the Republic. And so I think a brief discussion of this section of the Republic seems like a good you know, stick against which to rub the stranger's account and see what differences between Socrates and the stranger are sparked. Now, consider the problem that Socrates addresses when he begins the education of the guardian class in book two. He's addressing first and foremost spirited men. The whole city is prompted by the manly Glaucon's desire for relishes that culminates in the feverish city. Socrates' stated reason for introducing education is to make these spirited men gentle and thus to make them good guardians in the city. The first step in this education also requires a new teaching about the gods' nobility, justice, and goodness. He even refers in this context to the teachings about the gods as embroideries woven. The problem is familiar. The traditional teaching about the gods seems to inflame men's sense of injustice with Achilles as the leading example, and thereby incites them to impiety and disobedience. To defuse the guardian's anger and make them trustworthy and obedient, Socrates embarks on this project to revise the tales. But, as we soon learn, the extraordinary kind of gentleness Socrates seeks turns out to require extreme compulsion, either extreme compulsion on the one hand or philosophy on the other. And ultimately, the Republic, I think as a whole, teaches the impossibility of the political transformation it depicts. Now, to be sure, turning back to the statesman, the stranger may well agree, and I think there's some indication to this, about the impossibility of this political teaching, of this task that he's described for, for a true statesman. But that they agree about the impossibility of establishing these educational forms doesn't mean that they agree for the same reason that they see the obstacles to this reform in the same way. After all, is it even uh, Socrates' goal in educating the guardians, or the republic more generally, to harmonize the manly and the moderate? Taken as a whole, the theme of the republic suggests neither that Socrates seeks to harmonize the citizens of the best regime, nor even the two boys who drive the conversation. The action is set in motion because Socrates is compelled to hold a conversation in which he examines the meaning of justice and he creates the city to address Glaucon's and Adiamantus's frustration with the outcome of his examination, showing through the city in speech the very obstacle to providing the defense that they beg him to give. So, the impetus for Socrates' creation of the city, which is an examination of justice given by three different men, is actually more consistent with the Socrates we see spending time examining and refuting others' opinions about justice and other kindred subjects. 
Moreover, far from tamping down or moderating the intense hopes and longings in those whom he examines, often the man and the young, Socrates, in fact, stokes their hopes and longings. Think about Glaucon bringing him to that feverish pitch um, in his description of the idea of the good. He stokes those hopes and longings, in particular about justice, showing them that they care more about justice than they often realize, and forcing them in the depths of their concern about justice to recognize and grapple with the gap that exists between what they want from justice and what they are in fact able to have. Also, much more common, and maybe even part of uh, the education reforms, but more common than the kind of educational reforms that he presents in pictures two and three, are Socrates' famous exhortations to virtue. Um, and that is sort of where he seems to be you know, offering a, a, a version of a kind of political teaching, uh, especially such claims uh, as you know, virtue is knowledge, it's better to suffer than do injustice, no harm can come to a good man. But still, as we see from Clytophon's frustration in that dialogue with Clytophon, uh, well, these maxims color Socrates' own life with a very moral, even noble hue. They don't provide a teaching or a kind of doctrine that can guide political life, right? That's why Clytophon is so frustrated in that dialogue, because he, you know, he wants some real directions and not with the you know, the refutations and the, I don't know anything, I'm just asking, you know, Columbus-like, or Columbo, not Columbus. <laughs> uh, Socrates' own political activity involves talking to and examining others, especially the young, but not with a view to preparing them, as the stranger's account suggests, to take the reins of political life. Okay, now it is true that the stranger also speaks with the young, and as I mentioned early on, he specifically asks in this dialogue to be able to examine the young Socrates over Theotetus. He's kind of done with Theotetus, um, whom he examines in his office. But the stranger's interaction with the manly young Socrates differs from what we see as Socrates' activity with the young. The stranger teaches or tries to teach young Socrates, rather than as Socrates describes his own activity, for, the exa for example, in the Theotetus, and as he does to Theotetus, uh, to midwife young Socrates' own opinion with a view to assessing whether it's something true or, as Socrates says, merely a wind egg. So in other words, so is that clear? So the, the stranger is, is trying to convey a teaching, whereas what Socrates describes in the, in the Theotetus is that he, he extracts the, his interlocutor's own opinion, and then he sort of examines whether it's worth keeping or trashing. So let me give a couple of examples of this difference, of how this difference manifests itself in the statesman. The stranger refers to young Socrates explicitly as manly. When in the course, this is early on in the dialogue, when in the course of identifying particular beings over, over whom the statesman presides, young Socrates takes for granted that reason or rationality distinguishes human beings from beasts. The stranger compares young Socrates' mistake to that of an intelligent crane who assumes there are no intelligent beings other than cranes, and thus elevates the class of cranes over all others. Similarly, the stranger implies, young Socrates is too quick to elevate human beings as a group because he thinks he's intelligent. <laughs> now, were Socrates at the helm here, it's hard to, one doesn't like to try to imagine what Socrates would be saying, but do it anyway. Um, were Socrates at the helm here, he might take up young Socrates' pride in his own intelligence and press him about the status or grounds of it, as Socrates has just done with Theotetus on the previous day. He might ask, 
how does young Socrates know what he thinks he knows counts as knowledge, right? That seems to be the kind of direction Socrates goes. Instead, the stranger does nothing like that. And what he does is he presents young Socrates with the myth of Kronos, which clarifies, or is intended to clarify, uh, the particular nature of the human herd over whom the statesman presides. And we learn from this that human beings are, for the most part, needy, desperately vulnerable, and yearning for the age of Kronos where gods cared directly for them. Through this myth, the stranger appears to teach young Socrates that rationality per se does not distinguish human beings. After all, despite the absence of such caring or providential gods in our age, which is no longer that mythical one of Kronos, most human beings continue irrationally to long for them. He thus teaches young Socrates that anyone, I think through this myth, anyone who presides over human beings in the current age must be aware of and thus take into account just how dependent most are on gods, right? So the whole myth seems to be a way of kind of teaching young Socrates what he needs to know about other human beings, were he ever to assume this position at the head of a political class or as part of a political class. Uh, young Socrates resists the stranger once again in the dialogue when he hesitates to agree with the stranger's claim that the best regime, because this is what he does initially, right, that correct regime, the regime of the knower, so the best regime should never be guided by law that a, a, a someone who knows would be, that would be the most ridiculous thing ever would be to constrain oneself by having to apply the law. Um, uh, now, again, were Socrates speaking with him instead, Socrates might have pressed the question, as he does in the Minos, and of course, as the Athenian stranger does in one of the laws, I might have pressed the question of what young Socrates hopes for from law, especially maybe pressed him on this, the possibility for a kind of self-overcoming that law seems to make possible. The stranger, however, seems uninterested in provoking young Socrates to flesh out his own thoughts on or hopes about law. He seems to teach young Socrates the problem of law so that he can grasp the correct reason for law and then the need for it to be overseen and protected by those who are correctly educated. The stranger had stressed the rule of law in a particular context. Human beings are simply unwilling to subject themselves to a wise or expert ruler, right, because of their irrationality. So once again, the stranger is trying to teach young Socrates to understand, to grasp fully um, the irrationality which, uh, among whom he lives. So put simply, in contrast to the Socratic mode, the stranger emphasizes to young Socrates the irrationality of everybody else, <laughs> right? Doesn't encourage him perhaps to look inward and see the ways in which he himself might be irrational. Okay, in, in both of the cases um, that I mentioned, the stranger approaches young Socrates more with a view to the political situation of those of which those concerned with science, and remember I, I mentioned that young Socrates had agreed that, and it's possible, now I don't remember, that he might have even been the first to state that life without art and science is unlivable. So uh, um, the stranger seems to be trying to press um, him to become aware as someone concerned with science uh, of their political situation, as I said, rather than with the view to examining young Socrates himself, much less turning around to the soul. The stranger seems to try to teach him, as he says when he's discussing uh, the true statesman's task, to be, quote, willing to share in just things. The stranger seems to take for granted, I would suggest, that in young Socrates' manly nature, he is, if not philosophic, or potentially philosophic, open to a certain reasonable education. And in general, that the manly are somehow more fun
fundamentally reasonable or sound than the moderate. And we see more evidence for this in his account of how the correct divine, divine bond, remember I mentioned that, shared opinions about the just, noble, and good, would affect each nature. He describes the manly as taking hold of the truth and becoming gentle and willing to share in political life on this basis. The moderate, he says, receive only opinions, and their virtues make them capable of being only good citizens or moderate and prudent, quote, in accord with the regime. He thus implies that the moderate nature is more resistant to the truth if it's even ever capable of receiving it at all. And yet, as I've, been trying, as I've indicated, the stranger doesn't see young Socrates' maybe greater reasonableness as any invitation to examine him more fully. Now, there's a subtle textual hint, I think, that I think supplies a suggestion as to why, as to why the stranger is not inclined to the kind of um, uh, introspective examination, the cross examinations that we see Socrates engages in. Um, the stranger attributes the moderate slavish tendency to their erotic love of peace. He speaks of eros there. But he, so that for their eros for peace, but he attributes the manly attraction to conflict to only a too vehement desire in epithemia. This small difference, um, I think, points to an important difference between Socrates and the stranger's view on Eros. The stranger characterizes the moderate as more erotic, but also as less open to the truth than the manly. For the stranger then, Eros is not, as it seems to be for Socrates, an inducement to reflection or potentially to openness. So how then does the stranger understand Eros? The moderate, he indicates, are fearful, not passionate, in loving the quiet life, avoiding war, minding their own business, they're consumed with a wish for security from evils. So perhaps then we're meant to understand that by erotic, the stranger means simply the longing for what can't be satisfied. As we learn from the myth of Kronos, those who long to be cared for and protected from evils seek something that could be satisfied only by gods. By contrast, the manly are not erotic because although they desire too vehemently, their desires like other ordinary desires, hunger and thirst, for example, can be more easily tamed and satisfied through political offices or other honors. In the stranger's view then, while manliness tends towards excesses, its basic disposition is sound. But if I'm right about the stranger's view of the manly types, does he have an accurate psychological account of them? And I don't, here I don't think so. In fact, his account abstracts from the instances of manliness or courage that look most erotic, namely in its attraction to noble acts or to wanting to rule or to the kind of attraction maybe that young Socrates has for the law and for devoting himself to the law. The same kind of hopes that make the moderate types open to piety also exist in the manly ones, even if those hopes are often obscured by the toughness and self-possession that's also characteristic of manliness. In the course of refuting such types, writes so Olaf Lavkan, Calicles, Alcibiades, Socrates seems to find plenty of evidence of these hopes. Hence, in the Republic, he calls Glaucon both most manly and most erotic. 
Socrates' study of human psychology and human nature through his reputations discovers a common thread, a core experience of human beings, such that the philosopher himself benefits from engaging with and observing the results of that engagement with other human beings. This common thread, Eros, as Socrates understands it, exists in all human beings, including philosophers, um, including philosophers, and when it's recognized and understood, it confirms the superiority of philosophy as a standard for all human beings. The stranger's different understanding of Eros and its role in human nature indicates why I think he sees the statesman's political task as something entirely practical. Natures either are or aren't philosophic. And so the unphilosophic are simply a problem with which the philosophers must contend. It also explains why he may be puzzled at Socrates' continued reputations, right? As I kind of indicated initially, he's only just engaged in one with Euthyphro the previous day. You know, he's 70 and he's still at it. So let me just now briefly sum up. Uh, the stranger initially describes the political problem as an enmity between the manly and the moderate natures in the city. But this enmity is only one aspect of a deeper problem. Moderate natures are inclined to submit themselves to regimes that are ill-suited to the pursuit or protection, I should say, of art and science. The regime which is most hospitable to these pursuits depends on the creation of a political class where the manly respect, piety, and tradition, and thus contain the extreme tendencies of the moderate. Now, whether or not the stranger thinks this political task can be accomplished, he understands it in theory to be for defensive or protective reasons alone. Remember that protective cloak I mentioned earlier, which is the goal of the art of weaving. It's an entirely practical activity. The cloak it weaves protects and defends the city by protecting the knowers from everyone else. Socrates seems to see the philosopher's political task differently. It consists largely in refutations supplemented by a few doctrines, such as the myths we find at the end of the Gorgias and the Republic. And this sort of strangely makes him both more and less kind of active in political life, right? Less in the sense that his political activity would be coeval with his theoretical activity. So that less in the sense that when he looks like he might be doing politics, he's not. His dialectical reputations were not simple. His dialectical refutations are presented in the Apology and the Theotetus as being emphatically important for his own understanding. But his political activity, or his, you know, to the extent that I think he's more active in political life, it's possible, um, I think, to understand that in, in this in two in two ways. First, um, though his political teaching is in no way a blueprint for political reform, his investigations do provide some genuine practical guidance. And we see this, I think, especially in the laws. Um, because it establishes a common ground for reasoning about practical knowledge. And second, and this would be a somewhat different kind of political activity, not simply not a conventional view, political activity, but by evoking political longings in some of his most, in the recipients of his, uh, some of his most successful interlocutors, he offers a path to an education that is the only true solution to the problems of political life. But perhaps the true political art is displayed above all by Plato through his portrait of Socrates' theoretical and political activity 
that genuinely combines the qualities of manliness and moderation, Plato establishes a respect for philosophy that constitutes its own distinct open defense. Take it away, Mr. Elton. Well, thank you. Um, and let me be the first to thank you uh, on that behalf of uh, the state of Michigan, I guess. Um, for uh, yeah, that's right. Um, it, 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 I thought it was great. I thought it was a great essay um, and uh, insightful and persuasive and. Um, just a, 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 just wonderful to have a high-level discussion of Plato on really interesting subjects that are hard to penetrate and you really offer a, a lot. And uh, what I have to offer in return is, is uh, pales by comparison. And I'm sorry that it's uh, being recorded for posterity. But, um, it's okay if you never but, yeah. <laughs> no, that's good. That. Oh, that's excellent. Good. Yeah. Burn, burn the tape. Um, <laughs> of my part, anyway. That's uh, so what, what I have is a, is, a, is a kind of disorganized chaos of thoughts and uh, questions and reactions, and, I'll, uh, and I'm going to be somewhat selective and, and throw a few out there, and uh, I have more in reserve if they should be needed, but um, <laughs> <coughs> um, so, to, so and, and hopefully there are some uh, help and, and, and uh, interest. Um, so, all right. First, um, um, and, and it all has to do with the difference between Socrates and a stranger, which I take to be kind of ultimately the most interesting uh, um, and difficult uh, question and, and part of this. And um, so I'm, and I'm very much with you uh, in, in your pointing to the uh, to Socratic reputation, and maybe even, even more to the point, the exhortations to virtue as a kind of one-two punch. And, and I'm thinking of exhortation, bring out the attachment to and concern for virtue, and then bam. Because the stranger, after all, I think, is not averse to reputation as a part of his educative activity or whatever kind of activity he thinks himself to be performing, but the exhortation of virtue is strangely Socratic, especially as, to, as, as combined with reputation. Um, but so anyway, all of that in, 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 in general, I think that, that is, makes sense to highlight. Um, but, why is this difference in their approach to their, what I would call kind of philosophic or educative activity, necessarily a difference, as I think you suggested it was, on regarding what they view as the true statesman or the true political art? Um, or, and more to the point, you know, to, to be more specific, is it true that Socrates doesn't think that the point of the political art is to weave together those two types? You kind of suggest that it's not. I'm, I, I'm not sure that that stands up because you, you, you brought up the Republic rightly and, and I think you're absolutely, you know, this is what we need is to compare the education of the Republic with what the stranger lays out at the end of the, of the statesman. But you, you talked about the end of book two, but I think we need book three because book three is talking about moderation and courage and what happens when you don't tend to the kind of proper nurturing of, of those virtues, what happens if the kind of the musical types don't get the right kind of gymnastic training, or the spirited types don't get the right kind of musical training, and they kind of diverge, and they become too much of what they are, and aren't kind of brought to, brought to the middle, so to speak, or kind of tempered properly. Um, the musical nature is, is referred to as philosophic. I mean, I think everything there, it's book three, it seems to me, that is the, is the test case, and I'm not so sure. And also, by the way, you say his, his point is not to weave together Glaucon and Animantus. I don't know. I think maybe it is. I think, in fact, that's kind of a nice way of thinking about the Republic, that Glaucon goes one way, and then he goes too far, and then Animantus says, whoa, wait a second. And Socrates, oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. And we have to kind of bring you back in. And so isn't that a good way, actually? It's a kind of braid of Glaucon and Animantus that is not easy to, mm, but he does it. Um, which is not to deny, by the way, that, that the real point is book one, and the conversation, especially with Thrasymachus, or, or maybe Paul Marcus, or Paul Marcus's presence, or the conversation with Thrasymachus, or Socrates' own kind of engagement in, in, in either one or both of those, um, and maybe even Cephalus. But, but isn't that, I mean, is, isn't that in a way philosophy and not politics? And you're, it's very helpful what you put, 
kind of when you, you talk at the end, and that's also something worthy, I think, of, of, of elaboration. In what sense is Socrates involved in, in some political activity? I mean, even if we're persuaded that somehow the philosopher is the true possessor of the political art, the true knower of what, the, of, 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 of what a statesman is, and therefore is the true statesman in some sense, or the true practitioner of political art, as you point out, Socrates says he is the Gorgias. Um, doesn't that still leave some room, however, for the idea that philosophy is not mere, it's not simply politics. It includes the political art, but it's not limited to it. And so there's some practice of philosophy that's not politics, and isn't that more what we see? And, and, and may not may that not be the greater difference between Socrates and the stranger is their view, which has some bearing on the question of politics for sure, but their view of philosophy and, and Maybe they're not so far. I mean, I don't know if this is so or not. Maybe they're not so far apart on the point of, of politics, on the, the purpose of politics, on the true statesman, on the, and especially on the, the, the role of this weaving. Um, so that's, as I, as I uh, warned you, somewhat chaotic, but um, you know, hopefully somewhat helpful. Here, here's, the, here's the other um, question. So I really, really like your, your explanation of the uh, stranger's view of piety in the city. Um, and so let me, I'll try to kind of recap it and correct me if I'm leaving important things out. But the, the, the moderate natures, if we can call them that, uh, if they're left to their own devices, they're going to accept any scheme promising them order and security for which they long arrive, especially when, when uh, kind of in, in, in flame or spurred on by the by, by the uh, recalcitrance of the of the uh, of the man, and and this makes them easy prey to priests and diviners who are peddling Greek religion, which, as we know, is bad news for science and philosophy. And so you need the manly natures as a statesman, which naturally chafe under the yoke of this restrictive order and force of dependency, to give the pro the, the popular culture some backbone, some resistance to the reigning orthodoxy in order to give the philosophers some breathing room. Otherwise, it's too stifling with these, uh, these, these moderate natures and their erotic demand for and desire for order and peace will just insist on this extreme um, uh, piety and, 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 the, and the philosophers have no, no wiggle room. Um, now, this is intriguing for many reasons. And, and one of them is um, it accords with a different part of the structure of the Republic. The true city, the original very small city that they set up, which is this small, mostly economic arrangement among, I think, moderate adiamantist types who don't ask for too much, um, and seems to involve a simple piety, but also to be devoid of philosophy, among many other things. It, it's only the introduction of manliness in the form of the guardians brought on by Glaucon, the manly, who are needed uh, in order to provide luxury and leisure, that philosophy becomes possible. And indeed, these guardians are presented at first as having philosophic natures, philosophic thoughts, and something of a joke, but there's a pointer in that direction. Um, however, it's also clear, as you say, that Glaucon represents in the Republic not only manliness, but also eros. Um, so that, and that is some kind of difference, it seems, from the stranger who puts, as you used to say, eros more in, on the side of the moderate and less than that. Um, and this, now, uh, I'm going to introduce one suggestion and I'll kind of come back to it. This, it seems to me, might indicate, and this is just in reference to the Republic, and prompted, by the way, by thinking about uh, your, your, your paper and its relationship to the Republic, this may indicate the fact that, that, uh, that, that it's Glaucon, the manly and erotic, who brings in the reform that ultimately makes philosophy possible and, and, and makes the philosophic nature a possibility in the city. This may indicate that philosophy, insofar as it is erotic, uh, can be subject to the critique of Eros as blinding on account of the force of longing for the noble and beautiful. Okay, I put that up for, for just a moment, and, and as I say, to come, come back to it. But, but the, 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 the point returning to your paper, as you say, is that what we're pointed to here is the, the stranger's failure to apprehend, as Socrates does, the errors committed by the man in the account of their errors. They too are blinded by an erotic longing. Um, for peace, but for noble deeds, noble devotion. Um, now, this makes it seem to me as though you're saying 
that the stranger puts himself more or less in the camp of the man. I wasn't sure if I had this right about, about how you were characterizing it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's how it sounded to me. Manliness, well-tempered, cultured manliness, of course, not like stupid, uncultivated militarism for its own sake, but, but understood because that he, he kind of he, he made clear enough. But manliness, courage, is needed for philosophy. Because manliness is needed to resist and challenge prevailing orthodoxies, which are imposed on us with great force, um, literal force in terms of the, the kind of might of the, of the regime. But then, this kind of sounds also like Thrasymachus and Protagoras, doesn't it? Um, the sophists. It's this, in the sense that, you know, attachment to manliness, and it seems to be a big part of Socrates' critique of, of, of each of them. They're attached to this manliness, this courage as a kind of philosophic virtue or an intellectual virtue. And so, a question, is the stranger to be grouped with them? Is that, is that where he belongs? Would Socrates' critique of the stranger differ from his critique of Thrasymachus and Protagoras? And put maybe too simply, does Socrates think that the stranger's commitment to manly pursuit of the truth betrays an erotic longing for nobility that's problematic? Um, I mean, I, I, I mean it really is an open question because I think that's possible, but on the other hand, I think the stranger gets in some ways some credit from Plato that Protagoras and Thrasymachus don't. Uh, it, maybe most of all, that he doesn't show him in an extended discuss, discussion with Socrates. He doesn't show the Socratic reputation of the stranger. And, and uh, I think that may be an important indication that, that the stranger occupies a somewhat higher rank. Um, but at any rate, the, the question, and, and, and maybe to, to kind of sum up, Given the important place of Eros in the Platonic or, or Platonic Socratic account philosophy, does the stranger's divergence from Socrates regarding Eros imply a different view, not just of the statesman, but of the philosopher? And isn't that a very intriguing question to be led to, given that the unasked, I mean the asked but unanswered question of this trilogy of dialogues is what is the philosopher? And, and so isn't it fitting in a way, if we are led by the end, to start to ask the question, well, what does the stranger mean by philosophy, and does it or doesn't it agree with, what's on, with, the, with the philosopher and doesn't it agree with what's on? So um, let's hope that's uh, clear. Those are, yeah, and, great. And, uh, yeah. Those are all excellent points, and thank you. Should I? Um, I have a couple of thoughts. I think yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. Have, say, say whatever. And you then have. also maybe I think I'll go from the, the last one to the first because there yeah. there's also maybe that's also something that the, your first question we can have a more general conversation we don't about. Don't impose laws on the law. <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent. <laughs> okay, but yeah, right. If we don't know that. Um, so that, I, I think just to start with the, 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 the last question about whether where the stranger belongs, that's mm -hmm. such an interesting question. Yeah. And I, I would say only, I, can, I would only at this point give a kind of instinctive response to that right now. Um, I mean, that's also a little bit difficult because in the Theotetus, um, in some ways, Socrates seems to single out Protagoras mm -hmm. as seeing yeah. something that no other philosopher seems to have, you know, that he, there's a, there's a, a passage um, uh, in the Theotetus where he, he talks about uh, everyone else who, dis, who says the just and the noble are, everyone else says the just, noble, and the pious are conventional. Ex, um, everybody, all others who say that, but it, nobody but Protagoras doesn't say it like this, I'm paraphrasing, um, questions the, the, uh, the conventionality of the good. Mm -hmm. And so Protagoras does seem to be held mm -hmm. out there as somewhat distinctive. And I think that still doesn't mean that the stranger is in that category. And unfortunately, I suspect the answer to your question a little bit depends on the sophist. Mm -hmm. Because that, <laughs> um, it, which is why it's sort of, you know, this is taking me, I'm starting at the end of the trilogy and working my own backward, uh, which is not simply the wise way of doing things. But because that is where they seem to have the most sort of philosophic, strictly speaking, conversation, isn't it? And, and so 
the full answer also, I, I think, would depend on understanding what the stranger, how the stranger understands the problem of being, um, which, uh, as far as I understand, is connected with the question of the extent and limits of knowledge. And there seems to be, there seems to be some disagreement between Socrates and the stranger there uh, as well. So, um, but then on many other uh, themes that he discusses, uh, the stranger discusses in the sophist, I mean, I don't want to say I understand Socrates' account of being, but, um, but it, 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 from what I, the limit of what I do understand, especially on the basis of the Theotetus, it seems like there's some agreement there about something of the limits of what human beings can know. Um, but again, the stranger doesn't seem to understand uh, their also Socratic refutations, although perhaps somewhat different refutations than he's talking, than I'm talking about in the Statesman, in the Sophist. He's at one point he's particularly um, the, the 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 kinds of refutations they actually talk about refutations and the kind of yeah. Are you Dan? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Dan. Hello. Sorry, <laughs> actually, we never late, actually but... met in person, but you you may know about this more, so feel free to, to jump in. But it seems to me that from that when they talk about the refutations in the Sophist, the particular kind of refutation the statesman seems to think is not the most effective one is the kind of refutation that Socrates mm -hmm. engages mm -hmm. in, where you make people angry yeah. and you don't just kind of satisfy them but let them go away angry. Yeah. So that is a somewhat kind of, that might yeah. be a different part of the Socratic refutations and so that might reveal on its own a, a difference with the stranger that might be somewhat different from the mm -hmm. difference that is in the statesman. So the answer to that question is, I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. um, but, but, but I think it is a question, and I am, now just to say something about the stranger putting himself in the camp of manliness. Yeah. I'm not sure he's, he quite does that. I would say it's more, and I think I had this in a footnote that I didn't read, that um, I think it's not so much that he exhibits the same kind of problem or the same kind of attachment to courage that we see in Protagoras in that dialogue. Um, it's more that he, my sense is the way he looks at manly types is to say, they're, they're extreme, <laughs> they're reasonable, they're basic, they, they, they have a basically sound understanding of the cosmos, which is that, I mean, whether or not they actually believe in gods, they they want to they want to be self reliant. They don't want to rely on gods. And of course, for the stranger, that makes sense. Since the stranger clearly doesn't you know, think they are gods. So, in that sense, the fact that the man they want to be self reliant makes them more reasonable. Now, I think he would say they care about this too much. They don't have an inclination for study for learning. This might not be true of, of young Socrates, it's not clear. I'm not sure how the stranger finds out these things. But, um, but that they're, they're, they're basically sound, but just a bit too extreme with no taste for the philosophical life. So I think he would understand himself to be somewhat different from them, but understand them, again, just in his, I, I, I mean, maybe it just comes down to the fact that the stranger seems not to discern any kind of potential confusion in himself about, so in that sense, that might be a problem, any potential confusion in himself about <laughs> sort of how one might or might not have to deal with or whether there's any evidence for the possibility of a divinity. Um, and so, you know, the fact that there are these types who don't want to be subject to divinities seems reasonable to him, and he's not inclined to see them as in some way harboring um, a more complicated um, hope. 
Yeah, I mean, to, I'll just yeah. follow up briefly. But I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't mean to say that like, he's in the camp of the man. Right. Hashtag Team Manly. Most, uh, <laughs> you know, but but it, but rather the, from from your paper, and as I said, I found it yeah. persuasive. It it, it 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 seems to me like he's he's somewhat contemptuous of of the modern because yes, they're they're, they're they're just yes. they're they're kind of almost pleading to be led by this kind of these priests and diviners peddling this comforting myth and just to kind of stay in that and are you know and, and, and as you say it's a problem for science and philosophy here. And so it seems to me not only politically but also kind of personally and psychologically you need manliness as in order to break through that and challenge the false opinions that need to be challenged. And I would, it made me think, but I, you know, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean what it if made he, me think that he, he must, for his own part, think, well, yeah, that's good, you need that. I, I need that. And because you point out that he's not as critical of manliness as Socrates is, right. it led me down this road of thinking, so doesn't that make it sound like yeah. he thinks manliness is a good thing, you need it in order to challenge, uh, you know, religious doctrine that needs to be challenged, it's false. Um, and he's not as attentive to the problematic character of that spirited, um, uh, no, again, refined spiritedness, uh, intellectual, philosophic kind of spiritedness, but maybe he doesn't see, yeah, but then you also get carried away with erotic hopes in, in that in pursuit, in that direction. And, and, uh, but that just made me think that sounds like there's some against the protagonist. I didn't know where to. Well, I guess I said, I'm just asking the question. Is it possible that there could be types who are just kind of naturally, uh, you know, who didn't feel that they needed to struggle against mm -hmm. uh, yeah. against conventional mm -hmm. opinion? That were, I mean, so you have these examples in the earlier dialogues of like Theodorus. Now that is, he is a problem, right? Mm -hmm. He's not. He's no like clear, yeah. right? He's not the Eliadic stranger, but. I mean, I don't know, is it yeah. possible just to imagine someone who is, you know, didn't feel like the, didn't experience uh, politics, you know, in any way as appealing, um, and so never found it, you know, was always somehow sort of kind of naturally philosophic, naturally philosophic and so he doesn't quite see that, that I mean, it, he thinks it's healthy. But not necessarily feels that same kind of spirit and dignity in himself. Now, if what I'm saying is right, though, you know, Socrates' claim is that all human beings have this longing yeah. that has to be examined. Um, and if you've never examined it, if or if you haven't identified it or seen it in yourself, then there is something defective about your self-awareness. So in that sense, that there, there would be something defective about him. But whether that would affect, at one point you said, you know, there's some practice of philosophy that isn't political. And I think there is, and that we see very much him engaged in that in, in the sophist. And it does seem to me there is, you know, in that realm, there is much more agreement between Socrates and the stranger. Um, uh, that's, it's, it's, but whether the stranger's understanding is still perhaps defective because he doesn't yeah I mean that is that is a question and my my suggestion I would say just to throw it out there is that he doesn't have the same kind of grounds for but because he doesn't understand that you can that there is some kind of common experience or common ground among all human beings he doesn't discover the very important basis for knowing that we have a shared experience in the world, and therefore being able to say that our intersubjective conversation actually provides maybe not a perfect knowledge that we would hope for, but actually some stability. Um, and so that would be a failure that if he doesn't see that and doesn't under, you know, it, it is a failure of a kind. Um, in a way, it's a kind of a philosophic failure if he's having.
having to remain at a level um, of, you know, a, a sort of lesser degree of uh, certainty about um, the, about his own activity, or certainty is not a good word, but less certain about the grounds of his activity. Thank you. Um, one thing you said that I would also just be interested, I mean, I'd be very interested to hear if other people have thoughts on that, but uh, about what you said about the Republic, about the yeah. manly and the moderate. Yeah, I I mean, that was, all, that was my first thought right. when I started working on this, was that, oh, there is this similarity, and, the, and, and there is something to what, and I think the way you say is very nice, right, Cloud Con and Addie Mantis, they're kind of archetypes of the manly and the moderate, and the true city, and then the fever city, and so there is that theme there, um, but I guess I would just come back to saying I think it's a, a little bit of a distraction. It, it's 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 appealing, and one can make you know some real head some say many interesting things about human psychology and even about political life by thinking about that. But I think it's not the focus of the republic, and so because of that, it doesn't really reflect what Socrates' concerns are insofar as they're engaging in something that seems political. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, mean, yes, I have more thoughts, but I don't want to monopolize right. any more time. Yeah, Sorry, it's, yeah. Very, it's all interesting. It's hard. It's a tough dialogue, and it's a complicated argument. So, I, uh, But I, I don't know. I mean, manly and moderate, do people find that as what would you, I, I would be curious if other people had thoughts about that as a theme in the Republic. And, and then I would say one other question I, I had, sort of generally, um, is it, it also just strikes me as one difficulty with the strangers argument is, I'm just not sure, it's a, and, and this is part of what got me wondering, thinking more about the Republic is, it's a very nice, claim, there's the manly and the moderate, the aggressive, you know, the hawks and the doves, but does it really map onto political life? <laughs> and, I, you know, and I, I, I happen to know it a certain way in which I, I, I suggest that it mapped on a little bit to, you know, life, you know, in Athens, right, if you think about the Alcibiades and then the reaction to Alcibiades, um, with, you know, during the Sicilian expedition and the desecration of the Herms and you know, that the, there was this kind of pious backlash against someone like, did I say Achilles? I meant Alcibiades. No, I said Alcibiades. About Alcibiades. Um, but I don't know, just generally in political life, and I know this isn't this isn't adequate, but thinking about our situation right now, political partisanship, like, who'd be the manly and who'd be the moderate? It's not clear to me. And that sort of made me think, maybe this isn't a very helpful, I, you know, is this really actually a helpful political construct? Or maybe it really does just say something more about philosophy and some of the qualities needed for philosophy. And I don't know, that would be thought if anybody had a person to answer questions. <laughs> but I'm happy to take other questions if anything anyone didn't understand. Thank you. Well, that was very, very interesting. I think um, my question is about the opinions about the just, good, and noble things that are supposed to foster this uh, um, unity between the moderate and the manly. And I just I have a few questions about it. I'll throw throw them out, and you can do it do with them what you want. Um, I, I, if I'm remembering correctly, I, I think you thought you you suggested that those opinions would involved in an important way opinions about the gods, which I can, I can see how that would be the case, but it's, it struck me in thinking about it that what's said is just, just the good and the noble things and not the gods. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about that distinction or how these two things would fit together. Um, a question related to that is if, if, these, if, if these opinions about the just the noble noble and the good things are related to the gods, how do they relate to the, um, the myth that the stranger tells earlier? I mean, is in your mind, is, would that be, could 
that be an example of, of this sort of thing? Um, and then the last question I have um, is about, you know, this is really speculative, but uh, how, do you have a sense of what Socrates might, how, how Socrates might, um, what content he would give to those opinions as opposed to what the stranger would give them? And um, a thought that I have in, in mind is, might he identify those opinions differently to the extent that there's this disagreement that he has with the stranger about the character of manliness, about eros. I mean, it seems, seems to be your suggestion that in his view, the manly and the moderate actually aren't quite as far apart as the stranger thinks they are. So maybe would Socrates say it's easier to come up with an opinion that, can, that they can unite around? But is that... Um, Maybe that, and, and, but to that extent, maybe that could be good for the political community, but not as good for the philosophic types that they, that both Socrates and the states may seem to favor. That Socrates might be afraid you get a kind of uh, united front of the manly and the moderate against the philosophers. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm just kind of uh, trying to work this out. Uh, um, yeah. You know, off the top of my head. So I don't know. There's, there's a yeah. lot there. So no. you can't do what you want with it. Well, no, but I'd be curious to know more about what you were saying because, so I guess what I, I was, I was sort of thinking that you know we get some indication of what Socrates' view uh, would be, but again, that's complicated in the Republic, right? Because there he does revise the teaching, so the the gods are just in a very different way, and noble for very different reasons, you know, so what counts as noble, just, and good um, in the revised education, the revised tales about the gods and the heroes is, is very different, right? So the heroes don't laugh, they don't weep, you know, that it's shameful to weep, it's not noble, well, it's ever noble for uh, Achilles to weep, but it's certain, you know, I think it, it's clearly said in book three that it would be shameful you know, to be seen to do such things. So, but then I guess what you're pressing is, but, you know, these noble and good opinions, and I think this goes to this question about, you know, how serious or how much can the Republic be taken as, you know, as a, this is actually kind of helpful, how much would the Republic be taken as an education that is, you know, a real basis for a political education that would unite these two types? Um, even though there's something similar about the problem that he's dealing with in the Republic, I think as you say, the kinds of opinions that the Guardians would have in the Republic may not actually be so good for the philosopher, right? I mean, if you had this, you know, this Guardian class of, um, you know, I mean, super austere type, it's, it's so extreme, it's hard to think, it's hard to imagine. But, um, but after all, you know, we know that philosophy flourished in a democracy where people didn't have that education, um, and in fact, where, uh, well, right, where they didn't have that education, and in fact, there was a kind of manly audacity, like Alcibiades, that you know infuriates the moderate in precisely the way that the stranger is concerned about. Did, that wasn't said very clearly. Uh, let me try to put it differently. Um, so philosophy flourished in Athens, right? And in Athens, you had people like Alcibiades who do the, the precisely the things that the stranger is saying ought not to be done. So in other words, the kinds of, you know, the, the, the opinions that he's cultivating in the Republic are very different from those in Athens and may have actually been less suited to philosophy. But I think what the stranger seems to have in mind sort of is something kind of not as extreme, but sort of moving in that direction that we see in the Republic, where you have, as Ariel we put it so uh, eloquently, right? You have the, um, you know, the manly types who provide this kind of tough backbone and uh, 
uh, but you know they don't they're not provocative they don't challenge piety they, they certainly don't you know criticize it and and as a result they, they make the moderate feel much more comfortable you know they, they don't then force the moderate to resist them and throw themselves into the arms of you know the sort of extreme religious types so does that does that make some sense would that mean that they're moderately pious though still Kind and they're about, as you say, it's a divine bond. Yeah, I mean, that was, that's my sense, though. But, right, but again, when you, like, something like the, but, it, you know, you could imagine somewhat austere teeth, you know, the gods, a little bit like the Republic, like the Republic right? Yeah. The gods are there, but they don't get involved, so we're still very self-reliant. You know, they don't even, they, they don't care about us, so we don't really have to worship them, which, you know, would be perhaps make more consistent with a kind of manly, uh, you know, sense of dignity, um, augustness. That's the translate. That's the word that uh, Bender Daddy uses um, to translate. I think those references and the statesman we're just talking about. Um, you know, where young Socrates wants to make himself august in, uh, uh, like, the intelligent crane. So I think there is a kind of, you know, rational, more rational, more austere piety. To which I mean, I think like so. My guess is, you know, that I don't know, but you know, that I, I think because when I think of the soldiers, I'm like, well, <laughs> no, I mean, that's why I don't like being taken. <laughs> no, but I, I, you know, like I, I think often of, um, I think there are, you know, many soldiers. It's complicated, but right. I'm thinking of soldiers who aren't necessarily very pious, who aren't pious. But then, of course, you know, the history is littered with extremely brave and, uh, you know, extremely pious um, soldiers, you know, precisely on behalf of of the divine. Um, so, but actually, Zach, your your point is actually quite helpful because I think it suggests. I think it helps my helps my case a little bit thinking about it that way that you know that it, that Socrates the, the manly audacity that that the strangers concerned about was actually the you know the context in which Socrates flourished and philosophy flourished I actually yes yeah, so I had a kind of a companion question to Zach's first question um, so according to the stranger uh, the statesman is uh, tries to bring about uh, a shared opinion about the noble, the just, and the good, and so that seems to imply that normally uh, the courageous and the moderate each have a different opinion about the noble and the just and the good, and so the, just the first thing that I note about that is that seems to suggest that the difference between the courageous and the moderate isn't a temperamental difference primarily but rather an intellectual one. Um, they have a difference of opinion. And then, so my question is, uh, uh, what exactly is the difference of opinion? What do the moderate think precisely about the noble, the just, and the good, and how does that differ from precisely what the, the so-called courageous uh, uh, think about the noble, the just, and the good? Um, okay, yeah, let me just think about that for a second. Is it, so, is it true though that the temperamental difference wouldn't influence? Or well, I see. Yeah, but I, I said primarily intellectual. So, it be, well, its primary manifestation is intellectual. But the suggestion In would be it, it couldn't just be an epiphenomenon because the suggestion would have to be that if you brought about shared opinions, right, the temperaments would work out accordingly. So the temperament would follow the opinion. Opinion would rule. Right. Or the temperament can be adjusted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Um, on the basis. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and so, okay, so it's just, so the question, so what is the difference in opinion? Right, because yes, yeah, the right. claim is that all partisanship, they right. think, right? Well, all partisanship that boils down to this difference of opinion. So then what's the difference of opinion? Right. Well, the, a certain kind of partisanship, right? Because it's the partisanship of, you know, the, the moderate, according to the stranger, being fearful of these manly types and, you know, thus being drawn more and more into a kind of uh, extreme piety. Um, 
so I, I mean, wouldn't, so I think that that's part of it is that if the moderate, and, and this is, oh right, and you, you mentioned, sorry, Zach, the myth of Kronos. So the myth of Kronos sort of has its own distinct purpose in this dialogue, and it really does seem to be to sort of show what is the, I mean, actually it is, he states this explicitly, the myth of Kronos is to characterize properly the human herd. This was the thing that they didn't do in that first division, and we have this herd, this is the herd over whom the state provides. We've got to correctly understand this. And what we learn in the myth is that human beings, for the most part, there's a, a small group, so there are mainly always going to be a smaller group, and they're just, they, they long for a time when they were completely cared for, when they didn't have to worry. It is, so one of the interesting things about the myth is it there doesn't seem to be any, and so this would be a part of the difference on arrows, there doesn't be any con concern about death or mortality. They're not concerned so much about death per se, but they're concerned about not having enough to eat, they're concerned about stronger people, and being, and, and, and really they're just, they're, they're concerned about much more limited things. But they're, they sense themselves to be needy and vulnerable, so in the age of Kronos, wild beasts that hunt men, right? So it gives this sense of just this terrible vulnerability. And so the, so the opinion there would be that, you know, that the world is a world full of terrible evils and risky things, and there, there has to be, we're desperate for, and so they start to pray in the age of Zeus. They don't pray. Cared for that des that desperation, um, uh, according to the stranger, leads to this belief that there must be gods who, if we could just pray to them sufficiently and give enough, you know, sac sacrifice enough, uh, they will care for us. And so, we can't care for ourselves. Only gods could care for us. And Without that, life is a you know terrible and um, you know ultimately um, sort of just futile enterprise. So that that I think would whereas the opinion that seems to me to be that he's suggesting is guiding the manly is uh, we're human beings. You know we're different from the beasts. We should rule ourselves, we should take care of ourselves. We want to, you know, we, we want to be, you know, august, as he says. We, we want to be beings who um, don't bow down to anyone because there's no one else looking after us but us. So that kind of fierce independence on the one hand and desperate neediness on the other would be, and now I'm speaking a kind of temperament, but it's also an opinion, um, I think be the dominant ones. Does that, does that make sense? Does that make sense? Can I yeah, yeah. offer um, yeah. this is a, this would be a, a, let me try it in a very simple formulation. I'm thinking about Glaucon and Eddie Mantis. Let's see, and I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit. So formulation good, would be this. Yeah. Formulation would be the, the, the moderate types think that justice is a lot like moderation, and the manly types think that justice is a lot like courage. And, and justice especially, in, in so far as justice is a, a crucial part of the human good. And, um, and so, for, for the moderate types, justice is, you know, the quiet, you know, uh, hardworking, living within your means, in the city, participating, contributing to the kind of economic partnership, doing your part, not, you know, not, not needing too much, not asking too much, and, and kind of being a good cog yeah. in the machine so that it all works out, that's justice. I think it's Eddie Mantis who says, maybe when Socrates asks, where's the justice in the city? Right. They said that maybe yeah, it's in the need that, the, that the, they have of each other, as in right. you know, that working together, that's the thing, that's yeah. the whole thing. Whereas the manly Glaucon thinks justice is this kind of overcoming greatness, and it inclines me to think that for, that, that, that for Glaucon, nobility is more important than justice as a, as, as a component of 
of justice, this courage-like justice, we call it, right. um, that that uh, you know involves nobility to an extent that is not there for any man. And that would go together with Glaucon's being erotic, although it may, raises an interesting question with regard to the stranger, because I like the point you made that the stranger says the moderate are has an erotic love of peace, and, and that the courageous, it's just this too vehement desire. So does the stranger agree with what I just said? I don't know. I mean, if, if, if I think it's a good point. The stranger is the one indicating it's a divergence of opinion that, made, that is at the root of the problem. Because if you can make the opinions converge, you can hopefully weave the things together. So if the stranger would agree with what I just said, I'm, said, I'm not sure. Um, but right. No, that's I think putting it in terms of Glaucon and Edimantus is very is very helpful, right? And because exactly as you said, yeah. we see that in a way they really do have two different meanings of justice, yeah. right? I mean, if, you know. Glaucon's speech, it's the sacrifice of everything. Yes. And, and, for, and for Andy, Andy, Andy Mantis, it's well, it's not that hard. It's, it's not that hard. Right. It's like you could just yeah. get it straight, get the poets exactly. cleared up, and everyone understood right. it, and everyone would make yeah. the just decision because they right. realize it's exactly. better and stop having so many exactly. problems. Right. And, and uh, so it all seems so simple. So those would be two very different. And in, and in the Adamantian city, the problem for Glaucon is there doesn't seem to be any, any need for justice as he understands it. So, right. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's. That's very helpful, and I guess the question then is, yeah, what does the stranger have in mind? Yeah. And it's just very frustrating because he doesn't really say much, except that you know he seems to think. I mean, it, somebody said that maybe it was you, Dan, that it, it that there might be a kind of um, you know sort of moderation of each, such that there could be a shared opinion about justice, right? So if you if the if the if you know Glaucon you know, could be persuaded that or I mean again what he seems to do with young Socrates if you can persuade the manly especially certain types like young Socrates who's it's not clear to me exactly where he fits uh, but um, if you could persuade someone like young Socrates to uh, under you know with this account of what human beings are like, you could persuade them to not make the kinds of demands that Glaucon makes on justice and to be, you know, to be prepared to rein it in a little bit. And, and it, the stranger's suggestion is if the moderate just aren't provoked, I think, then, you know, they can be toughened up a little. And I mean, maybe the, there's something to that, right? Because it, I don't know if we think about just our culture. Um, you know, our cult, cultures can be more or less manly depending on what the governing opinions are, right? If it's, see, no, I'm not going to want to say this. It's the, but anyway, <laughs> you know what I mean. Just to throw yourself by. I know, I know, I know. I know. Um. I want, to, I want you to go back to what is probably the most speculative part of your paper. Uh, but I want to put my question in the context of considerations of the surface of this trilogy. And I, I'm almost tempted to just leave it at this question. Uh, does the trilogy, especially the sophists of the stage, which includes a promise uh, to answer the question, what is a philosopher? In fact, answer the question, what is a philosopher? Uh, and to make this very concrete, it's not clear to me from what you've said about the relationship between and the differences, the similarities and the differences between um, the stranger and Socrates, whether you think that the dialogue means to teach that both of them are philosophers or only one of them is a philosopher. Now I know I'm putting this as crudely as possible because I know how difficult these questions are. Uh, so let me, let me just leave it at that. But I think also related to this are other service features of the dialogue which you don't address, and I understand why. 
I mean, it is very odd, it seems to me, that in a trilogy or in a uh, duet of dialogues that, is, that somehow raises the promise of ask, answering the question, what is a philosopher? The, that Plato chooses, one, to have Socrates remain silent, comply, <laughs> and, and two, to have the speaker be an Eliadic. Why? To be a stranger. Why? To be nameless. Why? I mean, it seems to me you do have to be able to answer these questions in a persuasive way before you can go very far. So anyway, I, I, I just want to come back to this question of, you know, do, in your view, from what, yeah. you know, no, understanding the sure. limits of what you're trying to do, understanding the yeah, limits fair. of your understanding. Yeah. I mean, after all, you know, you, you, on the one hand, are very modest, but on the other hand, you have these big speculations <laughs> that, uh, about yeah, these wrong. things. So. <laughs> okay, um, fair enough, yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, th those are such big questions that I think, you know, to address them adequately would, you know, take a huge Work. Oh sure, I understand. I'm, I'm asking. Um, I'm right, right, right. No, I know, and it's fair, and it's I, since we're speculating, uh, you know, why not go all out? Um, uh, so yeah, why, I mean, the the why from Aaliyah, I mean, the fact that he's, you know, from the school of Parmenides is, is I think not as not one of the most difficult pieces of that question because um, Parmenides. You know, comes up a lot in the sophist, and does seem to be the other sort of big challenge, um, or the other sort of major uh, sort of cosmological thesis. You've got the Heraclitus on one hand and Parmenides on the other, and you know, Socrates' his statement in uh, the Theaetetus, where Theaetetus wants him to ask, talk about Parmenides, says, "No, no, if we if we start down that road, you know, we'll never get back to this question." So he seems as a Socrates had an enormous respect for Parmenides. You know, there was a dialogue of him when he's young with Parmenides. So it does seem, I, I mean, I guess a, a, just a quick speculative answer would be that, to go back to something Ariel said, that this is some of, something of an indication of the high esteem, I think, with which we're supposed to hold the Eliadic stranger, that he is from the Parmenidean school, that Socrates took that very seriously and learned from it so that if we're looking at the two men in terms of two philosophers, this really is the only, the Eliadic is the only alternative. And that he's not an individual would also be in, relevant in that, right? Because we're looking here at the kind of school or way of thinking that's the most, that comes the closest to what might be, you know, a, a philosopher that isn't Socrates, um, or that you know that he's juxtaposed against someone who's about as impressive as 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 you could be in terms of philosophy. Um, and so then the question about the philosopher. So it might be, I mean, should I just give a guess? I mean, might not a guess, but like my sense would be, that, or this is I think where I'm going with this. Um, you would need to have a good understanding, I think, of all three dialogues in the trilogy. Um, but my sense is that we get that the meaning of what a philosopher is is the upshot of these dialogues of the trilogy. That if you understand correctly what Socrates, the problem that he lays out in the Theaetetus, and then the challenges that are sort of quietly put before him in the in the sophist and the statesman. You know, what Socrates, what the statesman, this very impressive philosopher, doesn't understand about Socrates. If you can figure that puzzle out, then you understand Socrates as the philosopher, the complete philosopher, and why. So that there's my that that that's yeah. the working hypothesis. Yeah. Well. 
but to be, you yeah, know. I don't, want, I don't want to pressure you on that. No, no, no. I, I would like to hear that because, it's, it's, as I say, well, well, what's but, your I mean, just, reaction just to that? Just a simple question. Yeah. I mean, there, 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 is it the case yeah. that uh, one can answer the question, what is a philosopher? Or is it the case that there is really no answer to that question. Uh, and that's why uh, um, one can say that Parmenides, Heraclitus, and by the way, there's something Heraclitian about even the stranger. I mean, there are certain aspects of his teaching that don't seem to be sort of simple-minded to me, and we had it. And perhaps even the distinction between the two may be a mistake or an exaggeration. But so, and, and look, you 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 know, you sometimes get the impression. Well, let's just talk about Strauss, for example. Sometimes get the impression that Strauss thinks there was, in, some, in a certain sense, only one or two philosophers: uh, Socrates and or Plato. If Socrates. And everyone else is a sophist. Yet, Strauss himself is willing to concede that someone like Heidegger is a philosopher. So, oh, uh, I see. Yeah. so uh, it, it, I'm not sure where, where what your inclination is uh, in this on the basis of your study of this dialogue. Right. On, with respect to that simple issue, right? Is there something like an idea of the philosopher, or is the idea of a philosopher just a problem? I mean, you know, that's certainly possible, and I would say, that it, you know, this isn't very satisfying. The proof is in the pudding. You know, the question is, what does come out of, of you know, of these dialogues? But I guess, in so far as I mean, you know, I don't know. It's I, I would say that one would want to limit, or I would want to limit myself to saying or to trying to think about what Plato in these. Dialogues means by a philosopher, mm -hmm. and I don't know. I mean, I, I, have, I don't know what Strauss meant by you know either of those statements. Okay. And you know, again, one would have to look at the context in which he said those things and what he meant in the. So. Yeah, I'm just using yeah. this again. No, no, I know, but, I, and, but and and I'm and I'm only replying in the sense that I would say, you know, the decisive. Treatment, I, I would say, in a way, yes, because for Plato, at least, because it it's on the table, right? Yeah. So so blatantly on the table mm -hmm. is the sophist statesman philosopher the same? Socrates asks him. We never get the philosopher. I mean, there are some of these interesting, tempting theories that mm -hmm. I've heard from you know other people, right? Maybe the Apology is the is the dialogue on the philosopher, or I don't know. There are other other possibilities there. But um, but again, just my inclination at this point is to say that it, that I think the, the, the three together do kind of re raise the question or put on the table what are the, the crucial questions for philosophy and how, you know, how far, how far is it possible to get and, and and is, and is Socrates, or to what extent, is Socrates um, unique in understanding that, and therefore unique at least in his time? Um, I think, I think uh, just, you know, Plato doesn't give us the dialogue of the philosopher, and I think it's only fitting that we end the discussion <laughs> before getting any further information from Linda about the philosopher. Um, right, because so, that's a danger. Yeah, so please uh, uh, join me and <laughs>